Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you find yourself. Welcome to the uh, GW Liberalism Study Program online seminar. We are delighted today to discuss the publication of a new great book uh, just published by Oxford University Press called A Dynamic Theory of Populism in Power the ends in comparative uh, perspective. And that's really a, a wonderful book that is not only discussing the five Latin American populist presidency, but which is also offering a broader theory of populism in power, helping us understand how democracy transition or don't transition into non-democracy, depending if populism can be constrained or not constrained. And we are delighted to have with us today uh, the author, of course, and a discussant from our own university. So let me introduce them very briefly. Uh, Julio Carrion is associate professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Delaware, where he's also the founding director of its Center for Global and Area Studies. And he has been working a lot on, on, uh, on Peru and uh, on many other uh, uh, Latin American countries. He will be presenting uh, the book and then we will give the floor to our discussant, uh, Cynthia McClintock, who is Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the George Washington University. She was the president of the Latin American Studies Association in the 90s, and she very recently published also with Oxford University Press, Electoral Rules and Democracy in Latin America. So once again, welcome, Julio. Congratulations for the great book just out. Uh, uh, thank you so much for finding the time to present it to us uh, uh, today. And I'm giving you the floor now. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, let's see if I can share. Is it OK? Can you see the presentation? OK, yes. so let me. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have prepared a very short presentation between 15, 20 minutes uh, to basically highlight the theory part of the book. Uh, but before I start, I just want to uh, really uh, thank uh, the Liberalism Studies Program and everybody else at George Washington University for your kind invitation that gave me the opportunity to you know, uh, exchange views on issues that are unfortunately way too present today. You know, the, we are in, living in the middle of this global recession of democracy and liberal and populism. It, it's part of it. It's not the only reason, but it certainly is a significant uh, part of it. As as it was uh, announced, uh, this is a, a talk that is basically based on on this recently published uh, book. Uh, what I'm going to do is basically, uh, here is the outline of what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start with the definition. I usually don't like to get into definitional uh, discussions or debates, but I think it's important just, just to sort of lay out uh, in, in what way my definition is similar or different from the ones that are prevalent in the field of uh, populism and studies. After that, I'm going to uh, highlight, which I think is the central question of why we are interested in populism. I mean, to a certain extent, you know, why is populism in power such a question that concerns social scientists and political scientists? And basically the answer is because of this problematic relationship with democracy. You know, if there was no clear relationship between populism and democracy, we wouldn't worry, you know? I mean, we wouldn't worry in the sense that populism could really lead to the end of democracy. And as I will argue, is that the empirical evidence in, in this particular case from the Andes is that populism does lead to re, uh, regime change in some cases, but not in others. And so the question is why, you know? How do we explain uh, that, that uh, uh, empirical difference? And then I'm gonna end with a, a, just a couple of minutes talking about you know, the implications of my theory for cases beyond the, the Andes. So let me start with the uh, definitional issues. Uh, today, I will say that the most extended and accepted definition of populism is this idea that populism is some kind of discourse or thing ideology. Uh, it has become quite prevalent. It, it comes mostly from scholars who work on Europe, 
but it has also made some significant inroads in Latin American studies. And uh, professors Mude and Rovira Kalweiser, uh, as, as well as Professor Hawkins from, from uh, the U University of Utah, has been at the forefront of uh, uh, arguing in favor of what they call the ideational approach to populism. And in this ideational approach to populism, the, the key concept, the, the, the key constitutive concepts are the concepts of a corrupt elite, a pure or good uh, uh, masses, and then the general will. A, a, a general will understood in a Rousseauian sense, in the sense that it, 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 there is only one uh, general will that is not the aggregation of partial wills, right? It's just one overarching general will that transcends particular uh, uh, wills. Uh, one of the reasons why this, this approach or definition of populism has been so popular is because you can build a series of questions that then you can introduce in national and international surveys and sort of you can probe attitudinal uh, preferences or attitudinal uh, uh, reactions to these three three concepts, and in 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 a sense, it's it's a very, you know, as I said, uh, uh, a very accepted definition. However, for those of us who work on Latin America, uh, we we tend to have a completely different understanding of what populism is. It's it's, it's more of a de uh, ontological debate in which we are, you know, uh, uh, in, immersed. It's not really a discourse and ideology for uh, for many of us. Is populism is a strategy. It's a political strategy to seek and exercise power. In that sense, the domain of populism is not the domain of distribution, but is, but, but is the domain of domination. And it's about you know, uh, seeking and concentrating political power. And this definition was sort of uh, worked initially in the 90s, uh, from the work of Kurt Whelan and Robert uh, uh, and, and Ken Roberts, who, is who studied the Fujimori case in the 90s and then came with the concept of neo-populism and then they have been working uh, on this uh, uh, idea since then, especially Kurt Whelan. And in this definition, populism is understood as a, uh, a strategy in, that is characterized by a personalistic leadership that relies on direct and mediated su support from large numbers of mostly unorganized uh, masses. So my definition builds on uh, this definition of populism as an strategy. I think that we need to recognize that there is something really uh, peculiar about the way populist leaders, populist candidates see the political work and that we need to sort of recognize that into, into our definitions. But also I think that it's important that we say something about populism as a governance uh, uh, phenomenon. And, and in that sense, I sort of expand or build on Wayland's definition, uh, accepting that yeah, populism is, is a political strategy that exhibits a personalistic style of leadership, but it also has an anti-pluralistic mentality that divides up the political world between us and them, right? This idea that is a confrontational and, and to that extent, illiberal uh, uh, view of the political game. And it's a uh, phenomenon that has a general distrust of, uh, of check and balances. Uh, and I think that to what extent populism undermines or not uh, check and balances is an empirical question that you know I, I'm going to uh, uh, discussing a little in a little uh, while. So, what is the central uh, relationship between populism and democracy? There are overall three general views uh, on, on this, right? One that is it has a more uh, optimistic assessment of populism and democracy, and sees populism as a corrective for tired, worn out uh, liberal democracies in need of some. Uh, popular participation, some impetus uh, coming from the population at large. And in that sense, populism can really uh, uh, provide that impetus to renew uh, worn out democracies. Uh, 
then you have a, 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 a view that is much more negative, that sees populists as inherently dangerous or a threat uh, for, for democracy. And they see it precisely because it, of its anti-pluralistic and confrontational and illiberal uh, view of the political world. And then we have what I would consider sort of, you know, a, a middle uh, or middling view uh, of populism and democracy that sees populism as both a corrective and a threat to democracy. A corrective because it will strengthen participation, but uh, a threat because it weakens uh, contestation in the public sphere because of its anti-pluralist stance, right? So let's just look at what is the evidence, what is the, the empirical evidence of populism in the five Andean countries that I examine in the book. And what I'm gonna show you is uh, the evolution of the electoral democracy index prepared by the Varieties of Democracy Project in five Andean countries where populist leaders uh, came to power. Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, Colombia. The vertical line uh, signified the year when uh, the populist leader uh, came, came to power. So you will see a very clear uh, divergence in the way the electoral democracy index uh, behave or evolve in these five different cases, right? In four of them, democracy declined after the election of populist leaders. And the longer they stay in power, the lesser the level of democracy. And only in one case, in Colombia, not only the index for electoral democracy sort of remained, but it's, it improved slightly. Uh, in some cases, in some of the cases of democratic erosion, the erosion was such that we can really speak of regime change. You know, in some cases, we transition from democracy to, uh, we'll say, uh, hydro regimes. But in other cases, the transition, as in the case of Venezuela, uh, was all the way to just full scale authoritarianism, as I will argue Venezuela is today. So how do we explain uh, this variation? How do we explain the fact that in some cases, uh, pop populism led to non-democracy and even to full scale authoritarian regimes? And that's where you know, I built a dynamic uh, theory. And I, I think it's dynamic because we need to understand populism in power in a temporal fashion, because basically uh, what they can, do they can do later what they couldn't do at the beginning. So, the theory builds on some key uh, statements or, 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 or ideas, right? I will argue that every power seeking populist leader, and most of them are because you know, they, they seek to establish political monopolies. I will argue that every power seeking populist leaders uh, encounters or move into a battle zone, into a moment of crucial political confrontation where it basically tries to change the rules of the game to accumulate more power, to aggrandize its power. And the outcome of this moment of confrontation, which I call the Hobbitsian moment, uh, will determine the posterior evolution of populism in power. If populism is not contained or defeated in this moment, uh, then power asymmetry ensues. So a, a populist leader, a populist president that is able to successfully confront the opposition and defeat the opposition will develop a situation of power asymmetry that eventually will lead to the erosion of democracy. Why? Because once power asymmetry is established, populist uh, incumbents can also change the rules of, uh, of the electoral game to undermine electoral competition. And once elections cease to be free and fair, then we are actually in the presence of non-democracies. The extent of regime change obviously will depend on how long these populist leaders can stay uh, in power. So I will argue that power asymmetry leads to the erosion of democracy and even regime change. So what, what factors explain the fact that some populist leaders win during this moment of, 
of confrontation, but others don't. And that's where I rely on the conceptual framework of comparative historical analysis. And, and I focus on these two important concepts, permissive conditions and productive conditions, to argue that, the, that these conditions enable certain leaders to uh, emerge victorious or undermines the possibility that these leaders emerge victorious. So what are the permissive conditions? Well, public support and elite disarray, right? In some cases, public support for radical institutional change is stronger than others. And that explains also the degree of the permissive conditions for power asymmetry. Uh, same with elite disarray. In all these five countries, we had elite disarray, but in some countries that disarray, that crisis was much deeper than in other cases. And that also plays a, a, a causal uh, uh, factor in explaining the outcome of interest. But the productive condition, the variables that actually make the possibility of a triumph of a populist leader are basically the use of the state's repressive apparatus. I, I think that one of the main contributions of my analysis of populism is to really pay attention to this factor that is usually not examined in detail in the literature because populist governments are not lethal in the sense that they don't engage in, in widespread lethal repression, but they do use the power of the state in very specific tactical and punctual ways that lead them to achieve political victories that will not be otherwise possible without the use of this state repressive apparatus. I am thinking primarily of the police, but in some cases also the armed forces. And in some cases you have actually societal mobilization that, or the organization of society uh, to support the populist leader in the fight against the opposition and the institutions of check and balances, especially the judiciary. So in, in, in more uh, diagramic uh, uh, form, my dynamic theory identifies three moments in the evolution of populism in power. So we have the initial moment, the tsunami moment when the populist project is launched and you know they rapidly if the conditions are right, uh, developed uh, a, a strong support uh, among the electorate, and then they come to power. Once in power, which is time number two, they enter into this battle zone, which I call the, the Hobbesian moment, which is the key moment of confrontation. And depending upon on the outcome of that moment, then we will move to a third moment, which is the populist moment, when the regime has already established power asymmetry and then can change the uh, rules of the electoral game to reproduce the regime. If incumbents are defeated, however, then we will have a moment of re-equilibration where you know, another populator might be elected or politics will return to previous levels and the game might restart again, but for a while it's a moment of re-equilibration. Uh, in Colombia, that's what we saw, right? Uh, Alvaro Uribe was elected in 2002, changed the constitution to be reelected in 2006, tried to change the constitution to be reelected in 2010. Congress went along with it, organized a, a referendum, but both the constitutional court and the electoral board uh, refused to allow this referendum to, to go forward. So he was defeated and new elections were held in 2010 where a new president was elected. That was a moment of re-equilibration. Not so in the other uh, Andean cases, in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, and, and, and uh, Venezuela, uh, you know, the Hobbesian moment led to changes in the constitution that allowed uh, presidents to stay in power. And once in power, they actually undermined uh, electoral democracy in, in the ways that we saw in the previous uh, diagram. The way presidents or populist leaders win during this Hobbesian moment will determine the variety of populism in power. That, that's another argument that I make. I think that it's important that we focus on the different varieties of, of populism in power because some varieties do lead to regime change, whereas others don't. 
right? So my theory starts with these two critical uh, antecedents, mass discontent and elite disarray, and that when jointly uh, together they are present, then you, you have populism in power. Once you have populism in power, then we have this confrontation, this key moment where pow power asymmetry could develop or not. If power asymmetry does not develop, if populism is contained or constrained, then we have a situation of you know, constrained populism, which I think uh, Alvaro Uribe is, is a typical case. I would put Donald Trump also in this particular uh, category. But if power asymmetry does develop, then the question is how that power asymmetry uh, uh, comes into place. What are the factors? If we have societal organization and mobilization, then we move to what I call dominant forms of populism in power. If we do not have that societal organization and mobilization, then we are in the case of contested populism. And I will put Alvaro, uh, Alberto Fujimori from Peru and Rafael Correa from, from Ecuador as examples of that. Now, when we have societal organization and mobilization, the question is whether that mobilization comes from below or comes from above. And that will give us two flavors of dominant uh, populism. If the social organization is a state sponsor, then we have a situation of dominant authoritarian populism of which Hugo Chavez and Nicolás Maduro are good examples. But if the societal organization comes primarily from below, then we are in the case of dominant hegemonic populism uh, in, in, in Bolivia with Emma Morales is, I will argue, uh, the best example uh, of that. So it's very important that we understand the varieties of populism in power because they represent different ways in which power asymmetry is achieved. All of them share one thing, which is the use of the repressive apparatus of the state, but they differ in the appealing to societal mobilization and whether that societal mobilization comes from below or comes from above. Okay, looking at the cases beyond the Andes, uh, I, I think that there are many examples, both in Latin America and outside uh, Latin America, where we have populism coming to power and for a number of reasons that have to do with the that the strength of the party or the character of the party that brought the populist leader to power or the strength of the opposition uh, or the inability of the populist leader in power to uh, uh, convoke enough popular support for re-election, these populist presidents were constrained. You know, the first Alan Garcia in Peru in 1985, it's a good example, Color de Mello in Brazil, Carlos Menem and the Kirchner, uh, both husband and wife in, in Argentina, certainly Donald Trump in the United States, I, I will argue is a case of uh, constrained populism, even though it caused significant damage to democracy in the US, but democracy survived in the United States, at least until now, uh, knock, knock on wood, you know, he, he was unable to even get reelected. Clearly the permissive conditions for radical institutional change were not present in, in, in the case of the United States. The opposition coming from the Democratic Party was quite uh, unified and solidified. And Donald Trump couldn't even uh, win a majority in the first uh, congressional election that he faced. But unfortunately, there are many other cases where populism was unconstrained by virtue of using the power of the state, by having a strong permissive conditions for the re-election of these leaders, and by in some cases using a societal uh, organization. You know, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua is the most recent case. I will argue that that you know even in the election prior to this year, Ortega was already a case of a hybrid regime, and I will argue today is clearly a full scale case of authoritarianism. Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, it, it's another example. Uh, Erdogan in Turkey, and I think we are in the presence in the case of El Salvador with Najib Bukele, where you know 
we are going the right the wrong way where where electoral democracy in south in el salvador could be significantly affected uh, the longer bukele uh, stays in power he already won a full control of the legislature he already changed the judiciary and he's already introducing some significant constitutional reforms that may end up uh, cementing his power and in the process turning el salvador into a hybrid regime I, I actually think that uh, the uh, economist intelligence unit already uh, qualifies El Salvador as, as a hybrid regime. So that is the outlook of my, the general outline of my theory. And uh, I hope I didn't take too much time. I think I did exactly 20 minutes. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for your really a, a great summary. And I'm now giving the floor to Cynthia for some comments. And then we Thanks. will have time for the discussion. Thank you so much. And I'm delighted to, to be here to be able to talk a little bit more about Julio's terrific uh, path-breaking breaking book. I mean, it's uh, really a wonderful book and I really suggest that all of you uh, get this as soon as you, you can to try to understand populism and the dilemmas of our uh, moment. And you know, what's so singular about it is that Julio engages not just with the question of what is populism, but also this, this trajectory, this evolution, and then understanding these different stages and moments. It's never been done before. And, you know, these, this, these concepts, especially I love the tsunami moment, you know, the moment of the antecedents when the populist is elected and comes to power. Uh, and also this concept, it's perfect, and I think it's never been uh, suggested before of the Habesian moment, you know, this moment of confrontation and trying to isolate that and show how at that moment, uh, the victory or the defeat of the populist you know, affects, affects the future. So it's really, you know, again, pathbreaking conceptualization that helps us so much to understand, you know, this trajectory to erosion of democracy or authoritarianism or, or, or not. And that's the other great thing, know that we've got these five uh, different cases. They're, they're similar in the sense of a tsunami moment, you know, the election of the populace, but they're different in terms of the degrees of constraint. Uh, and um, so it's just really great you know, selection of cases to show these uh, varieties of, uh, of populism and these different, different uh, trajectories. So. Uh, again, a lot of applause to, to Julio. Uh, how would I uh, build on this? What questions would uh, you know, would I ask? Uh, I really like uh, you know, Julio's definition uh, and the emphasis upon the political strategy. You heard the discussion today. This is a real thicket. I mean, <laughs> this has been something debated and discussed by scholars a lot. And I think Julio does a terrific job of you know, highlighting populism as a political strategy you know, that we have know, at the start and, and through at least sort of some kind of a near of legality sort of in different degrees. Uh, but the, I, I love that concept to hyper presidency, you know, the hyper presidency with, uh, you know, the, 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 the increasing effort of the president to, uh, to centralize power. Uh, what would I add or build perhaps to that definition? I think a little bit more discussion, which has plagued us all. I remember back in the days of Fujimori and this question of the line between populism and authoritarianism. And, and I think Julio was just suggesting it in his comments with respect to Ortega, but kind of at what point do we just abandon populism and say Maduro is an authoritarian? You know, the, this veneer of legality is so so much of it is ridiculous. Let's just say they're authoritarians uh, for Maduro and, and Ortega. And how do you establish that line? And again, like just like Fujimori, the debates about sort of when did uh, Venezuela dip from populism to, to authoritarianism? I think that's a it's a really difficult question, but uh, not something to, to, to be considering. It will continue to debate, debate for a long time. And then also with respect to the kind of the, the presidency and the hyper presidency, uh, I think one question I would ask would be, you know, whether there is a need for not just kind of the hyper presidency, but a certain level of support for the president as a person, a certain level of charisma that we tend to associate with populism that, you know, for me kind of needs to be there. Again, when I see Ortega, 
in the in the list, I kind of wonder, well, this, you know, he, 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 his first election was not even by a majority. I mean, that, that it was a, he had uh, changed the electoral rules so that he could be elected without 50% of the vote because he knew he couldn't get 50% of the vote. And you no, know, he, he doesn't have that charisma. So it's sort of the difference between an Ortega and a Bukele, you know, and kind of, do we need to work a little bit more on, on kind of what that uh, you know, difference might uh, might be. And then again, I love this concept of the Hobbesian moment. It is just perfect. Um, that said, it, I think we still can build on a little bit uh, more. And you know, sometimes in the readings, it's, it's, the moment is a little bit longer. I was kind of thinking about the discussion of Trump and Julio highlights, I think the sort of the early days of the Trump administration. I was thinking, well, no, January 6th, January 6th. Um, but what that means in terms of a longer moment, uh, what that means in terms of the repressive apparatus. And then with uh, Uribe, for example, I mean, the question, when, when in, a populist is constrained. You know, in his case, I was kind of thinking, well, did he get to the Habesian moment because Uribe decides not to sort of obliterate the constitutional court or the election board? Now, when he accepts no third uh, election, if he had been, you know, Evo and Hugo Chavez sort of basically say, we don't care what the result of that referendum was, we're going ahead anyway. So kind of he doesn't, or even doesn't push it further. So what does that mean for our sort of understanding of this Hobbesian uh, moment? And then, you know, I was interested too that the, the Venezuela 2002 coup attempt is another Hobbesian moment. And then what that highlighted for me to a certain extent was what about you know, kind of the role of the opposition here and do we need to highlight its agency a little bit more? I mean, Julio's discussion of the 2002 coup attempt, which I agree with 100%, you know, does suggest that, you know, the Pedro Cardamona makes a big mistake. You know, he, he sort of suggests he doesn't care about democracy. The U.S., the Bush administration makes a big mistake by welcoming the coup. You know, to what extent did you know, opposition forces here play into it, and do we have to kind of bring that into their agency into the equation a little bit uh, more? And then uh, I guess this is, you know, again, quite a bit beyond the scope of, of, of Julio's research, but I think probably for everybody listening here, you know, there are also these sort of really large questions in comparative politics and the, the analysis of democratization, kind of how we would fit this uh, spectrum of the five presidencies into, you know, the really broad frameworks of comparative democratization. In this sense, what I'm getting at here is we have, you know, the five presidencies with Uribe and Colombia is by far the most constrained on the one hand, and then Venezuela, Hugo Chavez as pulling out all the stops to complete authoritarianism. So, you know, I think the work is great in, in suggesting you know, the permissive conditions, the conditions on the ground, the, 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 the use of the military. Uh, but I was also curious about uh, Julio's sort of broader take on that you know the context for that in the sense of uh, again the broader democratic theory. So for for example, um, as Julio points out, the the, the democracies in Colombia and Venezuela at at the particular point in the book are both beginning in the fifties. But on the other hand, Colombia had a much longer democratic stock. You know, Colombia's democracy goes back or sort of democracy, if you could call it, but it was still some sort of elections and civilian leadership goes back of uh, some hundred years or so, whereas Venezuela's had no democratic history before the 50s. So, so did that matter? So the greater establishment of these uh, you know, democratic uh, norms, and did that maybe lead the opposition to playing its cards better you know, in Colombia the, the, than in Venezuela because they could kind of look back and, you know, uh, have some knowledge and familiarity from those uh, norms. Uh, and then of course, uh, the economy and money. And as we all know, Venezuela, Petro State, I know how much did you know, all of the boom in oil prices uh, during the Chavez era you know, help. And Colombia was becoming an oil exporter, but it didn't have anything like the kind of uh, boom that uh, Chavez was able to exploit to 
uh, for, for his power. And then a little bit too on the US role because um, obviously, you know, the United States is, is no friend of Hugo Chavez. I was just talking about the 2002 coup attempt and, uh, you know, Bush administration's welcoming of that coup, which obviously sets, you know, Chavez up in opposition to the US, whereas in the case of Colombia, Colombia at that time, it was still today, has been a close, you know, ally of the United States. So my understanding is that the US was kind of playing a role saying to, you know, Uribe, we really don't like this. <laughs> no, no, no third term. Don't go, don't go there. It's a little too much for us. And I know kind of what, to what extent that you know, factored into uh, Arribe's you know, you know, thinking because that alliance had been uh, you no know, important for uh, for him. So again, just kind of these is quite a bit beyond you know Julio's. Uh, this this particular book, but I think they are fascinating questions for for us all to to think about. So uh, I'm going to end there. But again, I want to uh, applaud Julio once again for for a really insightful, really you know thoughtful book that you know, took a long time to pull together these these this, these challenging concepts and these really challenging issues, and to have it be such a you know, brilliant analysis of I don't know these varieties of populism and the evolution of of populism and power that you know adds so much to our our, our understanding. So thanks again, Julio. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for all this great uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 highlighting the different theoretical conceptual pieces of of Julio's book. Uh, Julio, would you like to take just a, a few minutes to answer to some of Cynthia's comment, and then I uh, see yeah. we have a, a question questions mm -hmm. arriving in the chat. Right. Uh, I really, uh, you know, appreciate uh, Cynthia's, uh, you know, comments and, and praise for the book. I, 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 and it's especially coming from Cynthia, it's even more valuable. I really appreciate it. So, so I have four four uh, things that I, I uh, took down based on on her comments, and I'm going to start by the first, which is the relationship between populism and authoritarianism. Right. Uh, something that I I sort of. Uh, talk a little bit in the first chapter I, uh, of the book, because it's an important topic. I didn't obviously expand too much because of you know, space, but uh, populism is a political strategy, whereas authoritarianism is a regime. And I think that that's the key, right? Uh, you could have uh, pop, populism it, it, as a strategy can lead you to regime change. And now you, know, you are into an authoritarian uh, government and you can talk or you can think about whether the origins of that authoritarian regime were based on a populist incumbent uh, or not. Because sometimes you know, authoritarianism leads to processes that are not necessarily uh, uh, rooted in, in a populist tsunami moment, right? And so I, I don't think that a, a authoritarianism means more populism than a hybrid regime has a little less populism and a democracy has an even lesser populism. I think is that it's, it's more looking at populism as the driver for possible regime change that can lead you to authoritarianism. And in that sense, uh, uh, whether you describe the government or the leader as populist, you should certainly describe the government or the regime as an authoritarian or a hybrid or a democratic regime, not based on the characteristics of the political regime. Uh, what, what happens is that sometimes we want to be, especially in Latin America, populism seems to be like a lesser insult than authoritarian, right? And so we just don't want to call a president just populist. He's more than a populist. He's an authoritarian. He's a dictator. The case of Fujimori you know, in the 90s comes, comes to mind. But I think that's part of the political discourse rather than the analytical you know, analysis that, that we, we do. So that in relation to populism and authoritarianism. In relation to, to charisma, yeah, that's a very interesting uh, 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 comment because not all populist leaders rely on charisma, right? I mean, Fujimori and Albert Uribe are such a good example of, of that. As you know, they were really anti-charismatic in that sense. However, uh, they, they are both populist that they play on this idea of you know, confronting the nation against 
terrorists or guerrillas. I mean, it was mostly a, a, a law and order based type of discourse rather than elites versus masses, and which is one of the reasons why I don't think that you know the ideation of the approach to populism is very fruitful, especially if you want to study populism in power, because you know knowing that populism is a discourse tells you very little about how they rule, you know, the kind of governance practices that they engage uh, with. But sometimes you don't need charisma when the opposition is very anti-charismatic itself, right? And so it, you need to see this in, in, in relative terms. Yeah, Uribe and, and, and Fujimori were, were very charismatic, but the alternative to them, at least in their uh, frame, was Shining Path in Peru and the FARC in, in Colombia. And so in that competition, Uribe and, and, and Fujimori won hands down, right? At least for the regular voter. Um, now, uh, the question of the uh, personal characteristics and, and, and the force in which populist leaders can reject the constraints of institutions and what Uribe did vis-a-vis -vis the ruling of the constitutional court. I spent some time in, in the book talking about it because all the factors were there for Uribe to reject that ruling. But my point is that it wasn't only the constitutional court, it was also the electoral board, the, the Consejo Nacional Electoral, who had already questioned the validity of the signatures that were collected because of uh, financing uh, uh, um, problems, right? And it was on the verge of calling the whole process of signature collection illegal, which would have brought down the whole referendum. Now, this is a counterfactual, right? What would have happened if Uribe had decided to push and said, uh, the hell with the constitutional court, the hell with the electoral board are going to follow with you know, the referendum? We have an interesting example for that, and that's Honduras, because Manuel Zelaya did exactly that. And what happened with Zelaya? The constitutional courts asked the, the armed forces to remove the guy because he was infringing on the constitution. And the army in Honduras said, happily, we'll do it. And then, you know, he was removed from power, in which is technically a coup d'etat, but it was the armed forces acting on behalf of the constitutional court, the Supreme Court in the case of Honduras. So the question is whether that could have happened in, in, in Colombia. Could have, you know, uh, uh, the armed forces uh, follow a similar petition from the constitutional court? We don't know. But the point is that even though there were very strong permissive conditions for a third term in Colombia, we didn't know whether the elite disarray was such that would have allowed Uribe to prevail under those circumstances. We know that it didn't happen in Honduras. I mean, you know, the president was removed precisely for wanting to do that. So that, that, that I will say is an, it's a question that we don't have a clear answer, but we, we might think that probably Uribe did his calculation and thought, uh, no, I cannot win this one. Especially because previously he had, uh, accepted all the rulings from the constitutional court. And then of course comes into the difference between uh, the strength of institutions, especially the judiciary, the difference between Colombia and, 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 and Venezuela. Yeah, that is obviously, the theory is not meant to overlook those differences. It's meant to, to say that there are different conditions that might favor or not a, a situation that will lead to the third moment, which is the populist moment, when you have complete uh, power asymmetry. And, and in that case, would Bolivia, you, would you like to Yeah, Colombia and Venezuela it. are interesting examples. I am sorry. Yeah, I know. No, 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 don't try. It's, it's just great, <laughs> but I want to floor. give, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> also to give the floor to, to <laughs> our colleagues who are in the room who may have questions. So uh, um, we had a question coming from Nicolas Saldias. I don't know, Nicolas, if you would like to ask the question directly or I can read it, and then we will have uh, uh, Jan Kubik also. Yeah, I could just ask the question, Julio, yes. how are you doing? Um, Hi, Nicolas. 
Uh, so I uh, a very interesting talk, and I'm wondering if you could uh, just give us some examples of this moment failing for a populist, this Hobbesian moment, um, because you know we all have these positive cases where they succeed, but I'm wondering where they fail and why do they fail? I mean, accepting the military coup option that we saw in Honduras, who you just articulated, is there a civil society opposition that has actually succeeded? in stopping the consolidation of a populist movement in Latin America or, or beyond, but more interestingly for me, Latin America. Yeah, okay, uh, very briefly, yes, there, there are. Uh, one color de Melo in Brazil, he was impeached uh, by Congress uh, when it was very clear that he really wanted to, to push uh, a change in, in the rules to, to establish a greater uh, power asymmetry. He didn't get that far. But the fact that he was, you know, not towing the traditional line of the uh, Brazilian elites led him to, to that. A much more clear case comes actually from Argentina with Carlos Menem, who wanted to uh, change the, the, the constitution in significant ways, not only to be reelected, but to give uh, to, to gain greater presidential powers. And that is a, a, a situation that in which uh, he was constrained by factions within his own party. And, and here is where, you know, whether the populist leader comes from a traditional party where, you know, he or she has to play with the different factions. And so uh, Menem eventually refused to have a referendum, even though he had already uh, 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 had approval for a popular referendum to get a second term when he basically signed a, a, a pact with the uh, radical party and, and also factions of the Peronist party were happy that, okay, he will get his second term, but then he will leave uh, and leave room for, for uh, others. And that there is a sort of, you know, that is the reason why we have populism in Argentina, even later on, but we don't have regime change uh, uh, in, in Argentina. Uh, uh, another case, uh, Jorge, uh, uh, I'm trying. I'm, I'm blocking on the name. Uh, the guy who tried to have a, a Fujimori uh, Oroku case. Uh, it was in Honduras. In uh, was it Guatemala? Jorge Serrano, right? In, in in Guatemala, I believe. And he actually had a uh, self coup a la Fujimori style, but he was defeated. He was defeated by a popular rising by you know the political elites and the military who basically refused to give him what uh, Fujimori uh, obtained in Peru. So those are the cases that come to mind. Thank you, Julio. Julio, um, we'd like to give the floor now to Jan. Yes, hello. Thank, thank you so much. Um, it, it is fantastic, this, this work, because it really helps us who work on populism elsewhere. I, I work mostly on Central Europe and Europe more generally. Um, so I, I have two differences and I, you know, I've been doing this for three years and I still do not fully comprehend whether it is this difference between um, Latin America and Europe uh, or it is something deeper in the sense that we just make different choices uh, conceptually. But I, I, I use the somewhat revised uh, ideational definition. And I, I was, as I was listening to, I was trying to figure out why do I do that? And why do you make your choice and I make my choice? Uh, I, I think that the question that I want to understand is whether people who say those populist things, because as all politicians, they say one thing and they do another, but they say the populist things. And when they are in power, this is why so your work is so important and helpful to us, particularly to me, because I'm looking at Hungary and Poland when they are in power. And they, whether the question is whether the, the, the style of governing or whatever they do in government is first authoritarian. Well, the answer is kind of simple, yes, it is. But the second question is, is this authoritarianism different than the authoritarianism that would be or was introduced by non-populist authoritarians. So that, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And I have some, I, we have no, I have no time to, to talk about. So that's the first difference, but that's, I guess, my justification of my decision. But the second is that I, I cannot do without introducing the second, second axis of populist horizontal, right? 
there's vertical, you talked a lot about it, people versus the elite, but this whole discussion about the relationship between nationalism and uh, populism, which introduces the horizontal axis, good people versus bad people, sort of good people versus bad elite, and then good people versus bad people. And yeah, in, in Europe, you cannot move without that one, right? So I work with the distinction between thin and thick populism. And, and thick populism thickens when it sort of develops a clear, more or less clear ideas of the horizontal axis, which is usually, Mude calls it nativism and Kalwasser, but it could be something else. It, in, in here in, and in Poland in particular, it is religion also, right? So this differentiates the, the faithful and infidels and, and so on, and builds on the anti-Muslim sentiment and, and in Europe and, and so on. So that, that's, uh, you know, I was thinking about my decisions, which is very helpful, but, but that, that's, that's what they are. So we, we will kind of look at it, the things somewhat differently. But the question is about so societal organization and mobilization. But because when, when, you, when you talked about it, I thought you are going to be talking about societal and uh, mobilization on both sides. But then I realized you, you rather, it looks like that from your scheme, you talk about mobilization of the populist forces, right? But the mobilization of anti-populist forces then is very key to make this distinction whether um, it is dominant or, or not. Um, and in that case, you know, like talking about societal mobilization, you think about movements and protest, uh, how do you look at the role of political parties and um, oppositional political parties, and particularly the uh, ability of the opposition to mobilize when populists are already in power, right? Because they do classically, of course, this, this move of divided impera, and, and they may be better at it than others. Um, and, and I think in, in, in places like Hungary and Poland, this is the key question of the moment, whether the opposition will uh, manage to overcome the ideological divisions because they're left and right, right? But non-populist generally. So uh, yeah, how do you look at political yeah. parties? And one, one leader you didn't mention, didn't classify, and I'm curious what you will say about him is Bolsonaro. Uh, somehow he, you, you don't have him there. Is, is he, where does he belong, belong in your mind? Constrained or unconstrained? Um. We don't know, but we'll know in October of this year with <laughs> Bolsonaro, right? Because he's running for, for re-election. And there hasn't been a significant moment of political confrontation in, in Brazil yet. And so we don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, yeah, it, it's, we'll have the answer by October. Uh, on, on, on the question of the uh, um, political parties, I think that that's important where this is where permissive conditions and productive conditions interact causally, right? Which is one of the arguments that comes from the CHA approach, especially from Tulia Faletti and work, right? There are, there are degrees of uh, uh, mass discontent and there are degrees of elite disarray. In the cases of Latin America, these populist uh, leaders emerge in context of complete party system collapse. All of them by, for different reasons, uh, but there was a, a significant uh, collapse and it was, there was only one party from below that led, to, that supported a populist leader, which is the case of Bolivia with Evo Morales. So you already have a very difficult condition for opposing using societal mobilization, the, the, the populist leader in power who wants to aggrandize its, its, its power. But there, but there were resistance. I mean, there were resistance in Peru. There was societal resistance in, in Ecuador. Uh, there, was, there was certainly some in, in, in Bolivia too, certainly in Venezuela, that was the, the most prevalent. But the question is where, where, to what extent that popular mobilization against the efforts of populist leaders to aggrandize its power has a chance against the power of the state. And I think that that's one of the 
of the of the differences that that you see in the case of central central europe i think that we we also need to introduce a, 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 a especially hungary a, an institutional variable which is the nature the form of the regime the presidential versus parliamentary right so orban has a significant easier time to introduce the reforms that he had because for as i understood uh, Hungary doesn't really have a full-fledged constitution. I mean, its parliament can really introduce constitutional changes with just two-thirds of the mm -hmm. of the vote, right? So it's, it's easier to introduce institutional reforms, and then you have an opposition that, as you said, you know, you have opposition from the left, op op opposition from the right, and it's very difficult to come together, unify, to oppose that, and that is an issue that is political. To what extent? In, uh, opposition leaders can have the forethought or the ability to put aside their, their differences and come together, identifying that the main threat at this moment is the populist leader or the populist candidate rather than you know us. And which is an issue that is playing out in Colombia at this very moment, where those in the center might not be able to come up with a single candidate and it will might lead to somebody from the right or, or the left populist from the left or the right to come to power. I know it's a very uh, not satisfying answer, but I, I want to yes. leave a little bit of time for the <laughs> next one. Well, it, yes. it is, thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, Julio and, and Jan. Great discussion. Yeah, we have a, a last question from uh, uh, Geraldine Garcia. There are, in fact, two questions, but I propose you, you, you look at the, the second one. Uh, what would you say the distinct aspect of populism in Latin America compared to other parts of the world? And here also, it's a kind of very big question, yeah. but that yeah, would be a way a to kind of wrap up. up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, well, discussion. that that's where we need to climb the ladder of abstraction or generality using Sartori's, you know. Uh, I think that they share one key element, which is popular and satisfaction with the status quo, right? That that that's what they have in common. If you don't have popular and dissatisfaction with things as they are, you wouldn't have populism in the first place. So, but the roots, the causes of that popular dissatisfaction can be different. It could be triggered by security crisis. It could be triggered by immigration or refugee situations. It might be triggered by issues of inequality. It might be triggered by issues of political instability. There are a, a, a whole range of why people become uh, unhappy. It could be uh, resentment towards you know, a number of things, but I think that they, they all share this uh, uh, deep political insatisfaction with the status quo. The difference might be the reasons why they are unhappy. And I think that just explains you know, different contexts. Wonderful. And in that case, would you say that there is some element that are shared by all Latin American countries separated from, example, Europe, uh, no, US, and the that, rest of the world, or it's really country yeah. specific? No, no, it is even, yeah, no, not even in Latin America, you can identify a common cause. I mean, in Peru and Colombia, uh, populist leaders came to power because they basically promised to have, you know, an iron hang approach to security crisis, domestic insurgency, in the case of Colombia, especially. Uh, but in, in, in other cases, like, like uh, Venezuela, it was primarily a, you know, an against politicians type of movements, you know, politicians have failed us, we need to just, uh, you know, get rid of the, the system that in, uh, put these politicians in, in power in the first place. Uh, in the United States, it, it, it's an interesting case because you know you have also an institutional factor that you need to, to take into account. One of the reasons why Trump couldn't undermine completely democracy in this country is because he didn't have a very strong permissive condition. After all, he lost the popular vote when he came to power. He came to power because the institutions of this country allow him to win the presidency by having enough votes in the electoral college, but he didn't have enough popular support to really move into a plot into a process that is similar to what you see in, in places in Latin America or Central Central Europe. 
Well, wonderful. I think on that, that will be the, the concluding sure. remarks of our, our seminar. So once again, I wanted to well congratulate you, Julio, for, you. for the great for the great book. As I was saying, I think it's really a book that will shape the way we are discussing things really largely outside the, on the only Latin American uh, uh, case. And thanks very much, Cynthia, for being with us today here and, and uh, giving really great comments. And thank you all of you for participating in our discussion. Our next seminar will be on March 8. We will have uh, Balint Madlovich, who will be discussing populism as a legitimate legitimacy challenge, the case of Orban and Trump. So back to the very classic uh, uh, Western uh, uh, cases. Thank you so much, all of you, and hope to see you very soon in one of Thank our next seminars. Thank you so Thank much, you. and congratulations again, Julio. Bye-bye. Yeah.